Hello, I'm Matthew Malcolm with American Vineyard Magazine reporting to you here today from Fresno, California, headquarters of Allied Grape Growers. I'm here with president of the association, Jeff Bitter, uh, to talk about 2020. And uh, it's just been another crazy year, if, as if things couldn't get any worse. You know, COVID-19, a lot of excess inventory, mm-hmm. and then the fires again. So California is once again on fire. But you know, amidst all the sensationalism and the headlines and stuff that we're experiencing, wanted to, to talk today about what's really going on, how the California wine industry is really being impacted, or what we project, because, I mean, obviously the crop's not all in, and who knows uh, how many more fires are going to come up or how long this is going to last. Uh, but could you tell us a little bit about the actual impact we're experiencing here? Sure. Well, most of the fires at this point, and we're about the second week of September now, have been concentrated in coastal areas. And so the impact has been greater over there, I would say, from an impact standpoint on those vineyards and grapes that are potentially exposed to smoke, or at least what I would call concentrated or fresh smoke versus uh, smoke that's just uh, atmospheric smoke in the air. There is kind of a a difference there. And so uh, most of the areas that have been impacted represent about a quarter of our total crush in the state. So I've I've heard people, you know, talk negatively about the 2020 vintage, like it's lost or it's not going to be good or or those types of things. And that, that is like what you said, it's sensationalism. Um, There's, there's a a majority of the 2020 vintage that's going to be unaffected by, by the smoke and the wildfire. So um, I'm not too terribly concerned about the vintage as a whole, there certainly are pockets where people are uh, are going to have negative experiences because of, of smoke exposure, but I think we need to be careful about you know categorizing the entire vintage as lost or damaged or anything like that because that's just simply not the case. Yeah, and although you know some vines may have been reported to have burned, uh, vineyards for the most part act as a fire break, so we're not so much concerned about the vineyards as we are the actual crop mm-hmm. uh, based on smoke exposure. And and there's been a lot of concern. You know, we've got uncertainty because of COVID-19. And to add that, we've got the fires and growers, even under contract with the wineries, are not sure whether or not their crop is going to be accepted. And I understand, you know, it, it takes a while to, to maybe get some kind of standard, industry standard, mm-hmm. so that the wineries can know what they need to do to test for it. Uh, but, you know, can you can you explain a little bit, you know, where we stand there? I understand you're in the task force for smoke exposure, if you could sure. address that. Yeah, so there's, there's a West Coast Smoke Exposure Task Force, and it's a combined effort between us and Washington State and Oregon, uh, where we're getting together collectively to try to identify you know, some guidelines in dealing with, with smoke exposure events and to perhaps uh, create some documents and some, you know, best practices types of, of uh, guidance. And that may include uh, things from, you know, contracts and contract language to crop insurance to research uh, to testing methods, protocols for micro-fermentations to be able to evaluate for smoke exposure and all kinds of things. So that's that's an active uh, uh, committee right now working in the industry to address those issues. But ultimately what, what we need is some funding. Uh, and so, you know, there's going to be continued efforts to reach out to our legislators to, um, you know, to push for some funding so that we can better understand the issue. How, how does smoke affect various varieties? You know, what, what is the difference between fresh or new smoke versus old or, you know, atmospheric smoke that's been up in the atmosphere for a while and then settles down into valleys. And there's differences there. And we know anecdotally there's differences, but we want to try to quantify that a little bit more so that we can, uh, you know, develop some standards and, and have a better understanding of when a grape is more subject to being affected than, than not. And so um, Australia has been working on these issues for a while and they don't have the answers yet. So I'm not thinking it's right around the corner for us, but um But the reality is, you know, in Australia, they had unprecedented wildfires in 2020, 2019, 2020, just like we're having now during their growing season. And only about 4% of their crop was actually damaged to the extent that it wasn't brought into wineries. So um, you can have these huge events and lots of smoke in the air, 
but that doesn't necessarily mean everything's impacted to the point where it's not not usable or unmarketable. So th these are the things we're trying to understand at this point. Right. So even though the Central Valley is a bowl, it collects pollution. It collects, you know, the the dust and and wildfire smoke. It's just this bowl that just collects it all in, um, and we can we're breathing it in. Uh, you're saying though that that's not that secondhand smoke kind of thing that the drifts in isn't going to have the same impact as the ones that are right next, the vineyards that are right next to the fires. Yeah, that's exactly what we've seen anecdotally. Again, I'd, I can't point to any specific research that's been done on, on that, but we've seen that anecdotally in many different cases, uh, including in Australia where, you know, large plumes of smoke blew out over the ocean and came back in and affected entire valleys, but there was no smoke exposure issues. So um, there's just the, those types of things that you, you observe. And, you know, it's like uh, sitting next to a campfire and the potency of the smoke when you're right next to it, if it blows in your face versus, you know, walking outside and being in a smoke filled uh, conditions outside, it's different. You know, you're, you can still breathe outside, you might have itchy eyes and scratchy throat, but uh, it's a different uh, concentration of smoke. Yeah, so what varieties would you say are likely to be most impacted by this? We had kind of the whites that have maybe gone more unscathed by the fires, I suppose. Yeah, I would say, you know, in general, reds are at, at risk more because they're just later season um, varieties. And so we're just now kind of ramping up into red grape harvest uh, here towards the, you know, first third or middle of uh, September is when we kind of really hit, hit it hard with the red varieties. So uh, those will definitely be impacted potentially more than the whites because a lot of the whites were coming off or have already had already come off when the fire started and particularly in the interior regions of the state. And so I don't see it being nearly as big of a deal for white wine grapes as red, potentially. Um, the other thing is that there's some mitigation efforts uh, that wineries can use when they process white wine grapes that have to do with, you know, them being pressed off their skins earlier than reds. Reds are fermented when the skins, so that makes a difference. And, you know, there's other, other reasons why uh, I think that white wine grapes will be affected much less than, than red, potentially. All right, and then lastly, with, you know, as we've seen in previous years, and, and probably already some growers are experiencing with rejected loads of, of grapes uh, under contract, mm -hmm. uh, what would be your message to, to growers out there uh, that are now uncertain about whether their contract is going to be void or not? A grower ought to have a, an opportunity to prove that his grapes aren't tainted. Uh, there should be not be any situations where a rejection uh, is is uh, enacted without some type of proof that there's a problem. And 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 smoke in the air is no proof that there's a problem. And so for growers out there that are you know questioning with their winery whether or not the grapes are suitable. Uh, there needs to be some tests done, and that could be grape berry sample tests, that could be a micro ferment and evaluation of the juice, and, uh, but that has to be done. Uh, every grower should have the opportunity to deliver his crop, and, and if it's not practical to have those tests uh, by the time that, that harvest is, is scheduled for, then uh, you have to look at other compromises. You know, do you go ahead and bring the grapes in and crush them and evaluate it post-fermentation? And there's been a lot of those kinds of arrangements, and we've entered into a lot of those kinds of arrangements, because sometimes you just simply don't have the time to get the test results back. But that also requires that you have a, a good, solid, trusting relationship with the winery and them with you, that, that you can enter an, into an agreement to evaluate it post-crush. Post right. So hopefully things work out and these fires uh, dissipate quickly. We're, we're praying for it. Anyhow, uh, read more about these things in American Vineyard Magazine, and we look forward to hearing Jeff Bitter's State of the Industry Address at our expos coming this November virtually. I'm Matthew Malcolm, CaliforniaAgnet.com.